Good evening. Good evening. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It always feels odd to come into spaces and say good evening and people stare at you blankly. So I, I thank you so much for that offering. Uh, welcome to this evening's panel, Interrogating Whiteness, part two, because one wasn't enough. Uh, tonight we'll be exploring some controversies and interventions in the theater. My name is Sylvia Spears, and I'm Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at Emerson College, and I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Facilitator, moderator, um, I don't know if this is a group one can moderate, but I'll try to <laughs> facilitate. Um, let me provide just a little bit of context for this evening's conversation. Um, uh, unless you are living somewhere deeply embedded under a giant rock, <laughs> you know that we are in a period of uh, unprecedented and incredibly complex conversations uh, around race and identity in the United States. So it makes sense that these conversations, questions, issues, and concerns are being reflected back at us, back to us, through the arts, and more specifically, in the theater. In the past year, the theater has seen its share of controversies uh, regarding racial representation on stage, with some productions being canceled which in and of itself sparked controversy around the limits and implications of race-conscious casting. Artists and producers are in some sectors working together to create productions and initiatives that actively respond to questions, illuminate questions, complicate the questions through theater. As artists and their audiences, there's much to be learned from these conversations, both the controversies and the interventions. Tonight, we seek to examine both. So first, I want to thank you for your willingness to step into this conversation uh, as we explore what we need to do, how we might position theaters as vital spaces for civic conversations of consequence. Uh, consequences inspired by art. So I thank you for entering into the conversation and I thank you for your commitment to increased understanding through a process of productive inquiry. That's my hope that we have established in this space. So as you will see, we have uh, an extraordinary group of panelists here this evening. Uh, to illuminate these issues, maybe even complicate them just a bit for you. It won't be tidy, my friends. <laughs> uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our panel. So we have Summer Williams, co-founder Company One and director of an Octoroon. Ms. Williams has been with Company One since its inception in 1998 an active member of the board of directors. Summer is a producer, director, educator. Her most recent project is an octoroon now playing right here. <laughs> Notice the set. Um, in the black box. Other directing credits include Colossal, Intimate Apparel, and the New England premiere of We Are Proud to Present. She's a teacher of drama and a director at Brookline High School and holds a BA in theater as well as a master's in education in theater and urban ed. Ms. Williams serves as a member of the board of directors of both Stage Source and the Coolidge Corner Theater. This is the short bio, just so you know, for, for everyone, they're getting the short bio. So please, please welcome Summer. Next to her, we have Melinda Lopez, playwright and performer. Uh, Melinda is a playwright in residence at the Huntington Theater. 
She is the author of Becoming Cuba, seen at the Hunting Theater, and the Elliot Norton award-winning Sonia Flu. Her work has been seen at Williamstown Theater Festival, Steppenwolf, Central Square Theater, Coconut Grove Playhouse, and Boston's Playwrights Theater. Her new play, Back the Night, will premiere at the Boston Playwrights Theater this month. Her one-woman show, Mala, will be part of the 2016-17 Arts Emerson season. Please welcome Melinda. <laughs> Someone almost jumped right out of their chair in the back there. Yeah. I saw, yes, that was you. I saw a little. <laughs> um, let's see, um, just a quick note. There's uh, a few other things I should have said about, about Melinda. She's an actress and has appeared in regional theaters across the country, works in film and radio, teaches theater and performance at Wellesley and playwriting at Boston. So that's just the footnote. And interestingly, folks have actually <laughs> sat in the order of my notes magically. <laughs> now that's some magical directing there. Uh, Ralph Pina, producing artist and artistic director, Ma Yi Theater Company. Ralph is the producing artistic director of Ma Yi Theater, an off-Broadway theater based in New York City focused on developing and producing new works by Asian American playwrights. Recent, di recent directing credits include developing a new musical at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, the Orphan of Zhao for Fordham Theater, Lloyd Sue's The Wong Kids, um, in the street of the space Chupacabra. Did I get it right? Go. Did I get it right? I had to practice. Uh, which is coming soon, uh, right here at Arts Emerson. Uh, that. Uh, Play received an Off-Broadway Alliance Award and is coming to Arts Emerson, as I said. He's currently slated to direct the premiere of A. Ray's Pamatmat new play, House Rules for Ma Theater in March 2016. Ralph is the recipient of an Obie Award for his work, The Romance of Magno Rubio. He is a member of the Ensemble Studio, Studio Theater. Please welcome. <laughs> On the end, we have Polly Carl, co-artistic director of Arts Emerson and also director of HowlRound. Dr. Carl is a co-artistic director here, curating an annual season of international work for the downtown theaters of Emerson College. Um, Dr. Carl develops dramaturgs and presents an eclectic array of work from diverse artists from around the globe. Polly is also the director and co-founder of HowlRound. We are being streamed on HowlRound at the moment. A, common, a knowledge commons by and for the theater community. In addition, as a distinguished artist in residence on the Emerson faculty, Polly has developed a creative producing curriculum for Emerson college students to fully explore the professional work of Arts Emerson and HowlRound. Thank you, Holly. So shall we begin? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so as many of you may already be aware, there are all kinds of issues uh, surfacing in theater communities across the nation, from, as I mentioned earlier, shows being shut down, questions being raised about who can play what parts, who has the right to play what parts, what, it, what is written and how it might be interpreted or directed. So here are some, just some um, questions to get us started. Um, how are these questions currently for all of the panelists around a race, identity, representation coming up in your work? And what are the risks and opportunities associated with stepping into that space of controversy or intervention? <laughs> he was nodding, so he gets to talk first. Uh, well, Mayi Theater uh, pro pro produced Jesus in India, uh, Lloyd Sutt's play that was, one, was probably one of the uh, sources of controversy. It was, it was pr um, produced at, or it was attempted to be produced at Clarion University, and they cast, uh, they had an all-white cast when 
uh, Lloyd's Place specifically uh, required two South Asians to be in the cast. And he subsequently pulled the rights um, and was then thrown into this big controversy being accused of racism um, and reverse racism by this community and Clarion University. The, Cla the president of Clarion University hired a press agent to uh, put stuff out in the press about Lloyd. Um, and uh, that became a, uh, a huge issue. And then uh, I believe, that, and so we got hate mail at the, at the mm -hmm. theater because um, we produced it. Um, but, but we embraced that opportunity so the so I think I didn't we didn't shy away from that rather we engaged um, we uh, friends of Lloyd contacted the dramatist guild and had them issue a statement supporting Lloyd and the playwrights rights we also had TCG the theater communications group and American theater issue a statement supporting Lloyd and there was a petition signed by theater practitioners and playwrights from around the country supporting Lloyd um, still we didn't get to engage with Clarion University because they didn't want us to come. Um, however, it did start a, uh, this big conversation around what is appropriate color conscious, uh, color conscious casting and what are the playwrights' rights and how malleable is ethnicity uh, in theater? Is it, um, is it something that you can play around with? Those, those are important, I think, important um, issues that, that percolated up because of that controversy mm -hmm. and has remained with us today. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts from other folks? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, Belinda. Um, I am super aware of uh, every conversation I have now regarding race and theater, um, and I wasn't a few years ago, so I think that's you know that's one obvious and simple way that um, I have uh, race conscious, appropriate or inappropriate casting has come into my consciousness. Um, I had the experience of being cast in Brandon Jacob Jenkins' appropriate last fall, um, playing a southern matriarch. Um, and uh, I remember talking with the director and saying, can we, can we do that? Um, uh, is, is anyone going to believe it? Um, is it going to skew the play in a way that the playwright didn't intend? Um, and um, she sort of generously said, just do your job. But I do remember, um, <laughs> just shut up, shut up and do your job. Um, you know, uh, Brandon, has, he asked to see all the headshots of all the actors mm -hmm. who were in his shows, and I remember having mine sent off with the pool and thinking, if he doesn't want me in the show, I won't be in the show. I didn't have it, like I wasn't anxious about it. I thought, you know, that's, that's the playwright's prerogative. Um, I was very aware of it, though. I was really aware of the whole process, and, and um, you know, and then I felt like what I needed to do was become part of this family however that meant. Um, so I think I'm talking specifically about my experience as a performer. Um, you know, I have another set of experiences as a playwright where um, I'm, I'm very aware of all the L Latino characters I create, right? They're, I know their background, I know where they're from, I know um, uh, why they belong in the play, why their voice is important. Um, I don't always have um, actors of color, I don't, characters of color, um, and, and I'm clocking now that I'm, sometimes I'm less interested in um, knowing everything about the characters who aren't, which is interesting, mm -hmm. um, and probably a flaw in how I work. Um, those are, those are two things that occur off the top of my head, um, which both have to do with being inside the process as opposed to what Ralph is talking about, being outside the process. I think they're significantly, there's, there's differences between those two things. Mm -hmm. so. There's this sense as, um, as conversations either within the theater or outside of the theater 
um, start to percolate that there's there's a, a approach avoidance, if you will. This, mm. oh, we we should have the conversation. No, the conversation's uncomfortable. To what extent do you think that the risks, whether they're personal, professional, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of limit the con the conversation, people actually having conversations around race as they think about what their work is, sure. who they're casting. I would think actors, for one thing, avoid that conversation because they don't have agency in the theater. Mm -hmm. they, they seek work. So it's the same with playwrights and directors. They're all looking for these theaters to hire them. So confronting these theaters about their practices is a scary thing, and right. it is a risk. Um, that's why I think it's taken time for, for the kind of activism that, that we need around these issues to, co to sort of coagulate. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, th there, there now I think is the time where people are saying enough. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're backing our claims with numbers. We can now go to a theater and say, in your entire season, you hired two actors of colors and 38 white actors, mm -hmm. but yet you received state funding. In which case, and in your mission, you state that you are an equal opportunity employer. Well, that's a law, but in your mission you state you seek diversity. I don't see it in your stages. Here are the numbers for your past five seasons. And we had actors Google the seasons of 30 theaters every year and look up every single actor and then Google their photographs to see if they're an actor of color or identify as an actor of color because actors' equity will not release that information. You cannot get a diversity report from Actors Equity about how many people of actors, uh, how many actors of color a theater hired for the season, because mm -hmm. it would create a riot. That's how bad it is. So in New York, in New York, two percent of all roles available went to Asian American actors, uh, where the Asian American. American population of New York is nearing 12%. Mm -hmm. Six or 8% went to black actors. And so the rest of that are white actors. And so we're talking about economics here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a livelihood. That's, that's what makes this thing uh, a real issue. It's, 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 it's a rights issue, but it's also equal opportunity. And so we need, we need to help hold these theaters accountable to that, or, um, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I, I, I hear in what you're saying the challenge of operating both at the level of individual decisions being made yeah. mm -hmm. in casting, yeah. as well as all of this operating within a structure designed, uh, I'll be so bold, to achieve, to perpetuate what it has created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you end up in this space where you, tr you know, the, it, the, the intervention at the individual level yep. uh, will never have the kind of impact that the intervention at the systems level yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. could and, or might have. And the risk is high because the leaders of institutions, in uh, theater institutions, cultural institutions in the United States are predominantly white and male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a risk. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and not only that, but I think the, uh, as are the boards of directors That's of most right. of those uh, companies. And so, um, you know, it, what, what is so exciting about, I think, this moment in time is that, um, you know, the, the very upside of the world of social media is it used to be that all those decisions could sort of be made quietly and behind closed doors. And I think that... Um, that's really what's exploded um, in the last couple of years and uh, is that that is no longer possible. It's no longer possible, um, uh, you know, to kind of get away with the, um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, the, the reality that the demographics in this country have shifted dramatically and the leadership uh, demographics of people in the theater have not shifted dramatically. And so there's this incredible dissonance and I think inside that dissonance is, um, a tremendous amount of frustration and anger and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, 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 you know, and a lack of equity that um, we are, we now, we now um, must address, you right. know, and so, and, and it's actually happening, I mean, honestly, um, you know, in the work we do uh, with HowlRound, I, I mean, we get a pitch 
almost every single day about some you know, inequality, some injustice, some uh, you know, event like this. I think we read about it um, uh, you know, uh, almost, almost every week there's some event that comes up like this. And so it's really, we're at this kind of um, explosive critical moment where um, um, you know, we, we actually must change uh, the, not just the practice, but the infrastructure that perpetuates the practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I'd also like to add that there's, uh, I think this is where it gets tricky for me because we have to acknowledge that a lot of this happens by choice, right? There are institutions that are making these decisions. There are companies that are making these choices. And so how do you not only dismantle uh, the policy and the practice where you can put Institute A, let's bring in uh, all female playwrights of color for X season. Um, or let's um, cast this show in this particular way. But that still doesn't necessarily address the source issue, which is someone is making a choice to present the world in this singular way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do you then start to undo whomever is making that choice? Mm -hmm. And that leadership position, that board position, um, I wonder could be called into question in a real way, in the way that it is, uh, perhaps high stakes for artists of color by way of livelihood, is there a way to kind of start addressing this by way of audience participation, right? Mm -hmm. Allowing the audience to say, this is something that's important to us. This is how we're going to prove that it's important to us. And we're gonna make sure that uh, our dollars kind of count and, and have an impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's not, if it's a theater that I love, but I don't love their practices, mm -hmm. how do I do something that can actually have a bottom line effect? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, um, San Jose Rep, a pretty big regional theater, closed last year because they didn't have the audiences. Mm -hmm. And they are in one of the richest counties in America, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, but they were doing Hello Dolly and all these other all these other musicals, and yet the, the community is made up 50% of single people below 30. These are, these, and a lot of them, um, a lot of them immigrants from India, from China, mm -hmm. working in the computer industry. Mm -hmm. None of them saw that theater as relevant to their life. So in making those kinds of decisions, the audience does respond, the community does respond and say, you are not relevant to me, and they closed. Mm -hmm. what, what's your audience at Mayi? I would say 50% Asian, 50% not. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a mix. It's, it, I think that in the beginning we were probably 70% Asian. Mm -hmm. And as we went along, that we just brought in into like the New York theater community. Yeah. And the thing, what's nice is we also don't have um, these silos of Japanese plays only attracting Japanese audiences. Yeah. So it's a mix, uh, which is nice. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, educating the audience and getting the audience to, to buy in mm -hmm. is huge. I mean, I know, um, you know, with the, in the Boston community, with the Wimberley um, and starting a program at the Huntington of, of doing uh, world premieres or first or second productions um, in the theater in the South End. I mean, there's been a huge buy-in from the audience. And um, I was talking with Charles Hoagland, who's the dramaturg there, um, you know, some of our largest uh, uh, financial, financially successful plays, productions in that space over these uh, 12, 15 years it's been open have been plays by women of color, local women of color. So um, Lydia Diamond, Kirsten Greenwich, um, uh, me. Uh, it's both the buy-in, well, no. sorry. It's both no. the buy-in, <laughs> right, both the buy-in from the audience saying yep, yep. these are people from our community mm -hmm and the fact that plays by women and plays by women of color can be financially mm -hmm. viable, right? Mm -hmm. This is a model, it's not, you're not doing a favor to these artists by doing their work, right? You're not setting aside one portion of your programming where you, you know you're gonna lose mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But you, you gotta check off that NEA box, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's actually, it's financially, it is an incentive for those producers at, you know, San yeah. Jose or wherever, right. to both cultivate their local artists and cultivate their audience to hold those artists close no. and look at the artists who are telling stories that are 
representative of the larger community. Um, but the diversifying of the audience is huge, it's huge. Um, and incredibly necessary. And yeah. and theater's expensive, and there's you know a lot of issues around that as well. Mm -hmm. Access. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I also think sometimes that diversity is treated as a concession by mm -hmm. these theaters instead of an incentive. Um, it's also they treat them as one-offs, so that if you right. do mm -hmm. a, a Latino play, mm -hmm. you expect You're the done. Latino community right. to come, right. but they, if they don't, then you blame the Latino, you know, Latino artists saying you're not a viable person. But it's, it, you have to reach, you have to engage the community. Mm -hmm. You have to keep doing this prog programmatically and not, not as a one-off. Like, I, 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 you mentioned choice. Um, you know, I, the, 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 the Center Theater Group, Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles is in a community that is over 50% Latino. But look at the programming of that theater. Mm -hmm. Where is where are the Latino plays? It's insane. It's insane. And I, I don't have a problem naming theaters. <laughs> <laughs> we noticed. So so Ralph, you have a long history of creating opportunities uh, for Asian American representation on stage, and yet somehow it seems like the the theater just woke up to some of these issues. Um, that culturally specific theaters have been talking about, addressing, working on for a long time. What, what are your thoughts about this kind of parallel universe where you've been doing the work and, oh, wow, this is an issue, suddenly surfaces? Yeah, it bubbles up every now and then, and you, it always sort of catches you as a surprise. But then I, I, I look at this as a civil rights issue. It's a fight for equal rights, and those kinds of movements are protracted. They are over a long time. I'm, I come into this in sort of in the middle of, of, of that movement. Uh, other people had, have done this before me, and the goal is to keep passing that torch until, until you see that day, until the dream, is, the, the dream is here, you know? I dream a dream, and, and that's how I look at it, because otherwise it will just defeat you uh, if you let if you, if you look at it as these kind of um, uh, huge obstacles that are thrown uh, in your way uh, every year or so. Uh, but yeah, you keep going, and I think you work harder even. You, you work even harder to, to, get, to get that message across. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you do it, and you do it, you prove it by putting up plays that, that don't suck. <laughs> in theater, you don't self-marginalize right. by doing bad plays. Mm -hmm. that, so I am holding everyone in our company. You can't do a bad play. Yeah. You have to be better than everyone around you. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how the, the discourse, the yeah. dynamics around this issue um, models, replicates exactly the issues around race in hiring, not, it's not okay just to be good, yeah. it has to be superior, so the standards are even yeah. raised because you know what, what the consequences are yeah. if they're not. So, what, so what, what are the implications for folks like you, Polly, who as a curator, you know, how do you encourage authentic, uh, artist-driven representation of communities of color in a way that's responsible. How do folks in, a, in that role do that work? Well, I, I think the, it feels to me like the, um, the role of the curator uh, historically has been so much about, um, you know, uh, things that are a reflection of, you know, me as the curator, you know, so that it's about what I like and my taste. And, and I feel like, um, uh, I don't know, I just feel like that era of curation is passing by in a way that is a relief to me because I actually don't want to take responsibility um, for um, deciding what everybody should think is good art. Um, and so I feel like the, I think the, the role uh, that, that we have to take on in the, in the curation is, is really, um, uh, you know, it's about, uh, it's a ton of listening. It's about listening uh, to uh, communities, um, you know, and neighborhoods um, it's about uh, traveling, um, uh, you know, uh, nationally and internationally, and really um, uh, being aware of what's out there. I think there's some way 
in which, um, uh, you know, uh, if you're not looking, you're not going to find it. Um, and, uh, and so there's always that excuse of, oh, I, do, I couldn't find that, or I couldn't cast that mm -hmm. part, or I couldn't. And I'm always, my, always, my question is, well, how, how hard did you look? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, like we, you know, we had a, we've, we've had a really incredible experience in the work of HowlRound to be partnering with the Latino Theater Commons over the last four years almost now. And I can't tell you the amount of incredible Latino work that's happening around the country. Um, and it's been happening. And, you know, one of the, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, happened to me personally was, you know, as I started working with the company, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe how many things I didn't know about until I started working with the commons. And when I started working with the Latino Theater Commons, I, I, you know, I, I, I actually discovered I had known the artist, but I was like, um, one of the great ensembles in our history in America is the Latino Theater Company, and I, I didn't know their work. And suddenly I go out to LA and I'm like, this is some of the finest work I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I'd been in the theater, you know, many years at that point. And so I know I wasn't looking hard enough. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're bringing Latino Theater Company here at the end of the season with a wonderful piece. And the, so it's, I think it's, you, you know, you, you have to um, actually think outside what you already know. And I think in a weird way, um, we're trained often in the work to uh, refine our aesthetic or uh, shrink our aesthetic. And I think the work is to actually expand um, uh, our sense of the world. Uh, and, uh, and so I think the, the work is out there, the artists are out there, the stories are out there, um, and it's our job to be listening and looking and finding, so. So Melinda, um, as a playwright um, who has written a range of culturally specific characters, how do you approach this complicated work of casting, um, of the casting process, and how specific are you? You mentioned earlier, you know, writing Latino um, characters. How specific are you, and um, are there circumstances where where fluidity yeah. in casting uh, is comfortable, acceptable, makes sense, useful? So, um, uh, my play, Sonia Flew, has two characters who are Jewish in the first act and Cuban in the second act, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can't appropriately cast that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, I, you, you probably, I mean, you probably could, but, um, uh, you know, and I, I was aware when I wrote those characters that with all intentionality, we were gonna cast actors in those parts. Um, because the thrill for me is seeing actors literally transform in front of your eyes. It's, I, I love to see multiple roles played by the same actor. I love to see very quick transformations. I, I want to see actors reaching and stretching. I want to see them using huge language. I want to see them juggle on stage. I want, you know, we talked about magic, right? For me, that's, that's my hook. But the other thing is, is that I write very specific women with a, of a very particular uh, cultural background. And, um, you know, when we're casting Cuban women, you know, or Cuban American women, and I see, um, I have a whole day with incredible actresses, and I know within, I know within one minute, if her background is Mexican, her background is uh, Argentinian, her background is Puerto Rican. Um, and in some cases, you can't tell, but, but I know it because it's my culture and it's my language. Um, I, I had uh, mentioned earlier, you know, I saw the production of Disgraced at the Huntington, and um, I did not know, watching the play, what the background of the actor playing Amir was. I didn't know if that actor was Pakistani or if he was Iraqi or if he was Saudi Arabian. I did not know his background. Um, he was the role. He convinced me he was that part, and I went, I suspended disbelief, and I entered that world. I bet, though, that the playwright knows. I bet that that playwright knew, right? So for me as an audience member, because it's not my history, I might not have that degree of sophistication. So when I'm looking to cast a role where um, I know that woman, everyone who casts a role, you don't, you know, it's all about compromise. Right? And so you hope to cast the best actor who gets closest to the role, um, and almost always it means someone who has a Latino background. 
Um, but you know, in the case of Sonia Flew, it didn't. Um, I had two extraordinary men who transformed into, you know, two extraordinary Jewish men who ex transformed into two extraordinary Cuban men. Um, you know, I, um, I, I, I'm not gonna hold out for the, you know, one-legged beauty queen with, you know, who's nearsighted and can juggle because that's the part that I wrote. Um, I think it's the job of an actor to convince the audience. You know, that said, I think the issue of access is incredibly important. Um, uh, you have to be really practical in the theater. So if we're casting a show where we have access to actors from New York, I'm not gonna consider anyone who doesn't come really close to my ideal. Um, if you're casting a tiny little show in a theater in uh, you know, this middle of the US, if I'm part of that, you know, I'm gonna have more flexibility with it. Um, we have aspirations and then we have to get the show up, right? Mm -hmm. Opening night note doesn't change. So um, uh, I, I believe in the voice of the playwright. I believe in the power of the playwright to put forward their parameters. Um, I will always stand behind that. Um, you know, but I have concerns about um, theaters in communities that don't have a lot of people of color not taking on plays by writers of color because they fear they can't cast them. Um, I would not want my plays to be, uh, not to be produced mm -hmm. in Kansas or, uh, well, there's plenty of Latinos in Kansas, but maybe not a lot of Latino performers. So I, you know, I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't want to shut myself out of that dialogue with an audience. Um, but again, I, that, I'm one person, um, and I'm only speaking for myself. I think so much of it has to do with the context that gets wrapped around it, though, and that's what you can't control, unfortunately. Right. Um, so I, I hear your point. Um, but I, I also get nervous contextually about, you know, wherever you are and you feel like, well, I don't have that person. And you may not have that person because you legitimately don't have that person. Right. Or you may not have that person because you haven't done your due diligence to actually find that person right. or to cultivate that person and grow that person right. and invest in that person. And so making sure that you have done your work on that end, mm -hmm. I think, is important before you make the leap to say, well, I don't have, and so I'm just going to go ahead and do right. X. But it, I'm not producing my play. Right, right, right. right someone right. else is producing it. You know, right. it's like you, someone, you, like you said, someone picked you, right? And so what do you do with that? Right. You have to, there, there's, a, there is an element of faith every time, every time your play, you know, or leaves your backyard. But you know, mm -hmm. this is the difference. So you know, playwright, actor, right. producer, director, right? right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the different hats that you wear when you're thinking about these things. Yeah. So yeah, th th I was just gonna say, I, and I just want to say that that's what's so, um, you know, kind of really was unique about what I think Lloyd did and Katori did as writers. Um, Katori mm -hmm. Hall was uh, wrote a play called The, M the Mountaintop, and um, uh, it was cast with. Um, uh, an African-American Martin Luther King and a white Martin Luther King and they were supposed to switch off or something and then the African-American uh, Martin Luther King left and so she also closed that show down and Lloyd clo closed his uh, show down and I think um, it's, it's a remarkable moment in our history when the playwright is empowered um, to say actually no, right. uh, I, that's not what I meant and that's not what I'm gonna do and I feel like that's a real, um, uh, uh, that's a very important moment in our hi history for um, you know artists to be beginning to control um, the destiny of their work in a way. Uh, it feels like a really important moment, and to make that decision, and that not all artists are going to make the same decisions, and and and, and the same decision. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so it's an interesting um, time. It's you know, in my, I don't know, Ralph, you you know you. I can't think of a number of time where it's happened that many times in a year. Yeah, yeah. and just b the year before, I think, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think uh, Stephen Adley Gerges' play, yes. Mother yes, with a Hat, right. Right. was done in Connecticut mm -hmm. with not a Latino actor. Mm -hmm. And he didn't find out mm -hmm. until 
during the run, mm -hmm. and in which case he had this big, you know, public spat with the mm -hmm. with the director. Um, but yes, we also uh, recently the Mikado in New York mm -hmm. by the New York Gilbert and Sullivan Players was shut down because the, um, the Asian community in New York uh, organized and engaged that theater and said, we don't want you doing Yellow Face mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and they pulled that production, including the national tour of that, and, and, and did um, uh, another, uh, did the Pirates of Penzance instead, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't require Asians. <laughs> <laughs> It feels like the, the thing that feels of the moment is that we are now far more interconnected than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, like I feel like I'm able to have a grasp on or know more about what's happening in terms of theater on the other side of the country mm -hmm. without physically being present in a way that I've never experienced before. And I think a part of the kind of what's bubbling up is not just kind of the stuff that's in the air about race and representation, but also how we're all able to uh, wrap ourselves around it from all of these different angles. How round is yeah, big. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. So, w as I mentioned, we're sitting here on the set of Ben Octoroon, mm -hmm. um, and the playwright Brandon Jacobs Jenkins intentionally asks actors and requires of actors inhabiting other races. How, Summer, how do you create um, an environment um, that makes that possible, and what would you say the conditions are that allow that kind of, um, you know, the, the people in place of in a way that is, you know, both true to the script, um, responsive to actors, um, convolutes things for the audience in all the, all the right ways. What would you say, what in your process, what, how does that work? You strap them down. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really, it's, it's sensitivity. It's, it's full of complication. Sometimes it's full of humor. Sometimes it's full of tears. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, this is the second play um, that I've directed by Brandon Jacob Jenkins. The first was Neighbors. These are they're two very different plays, but they both use, um, uh, so in Octoroon, you'll see black face, uh, white face, and uh, no other term, it's all unfortunate, red face. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's very pointed, you're watching people prepare to jump into the world of the play. Um, in, in Neighbors, uh, the conceit is that there are two families living next door to each other. Uh, one, the father is a, um, a professor of uh, classics, Greek literature, I believe, uh, who also happens to be a black man married to a white woman and their child. And they have new neighbors, and those new neighbors are the Kuhn family. And it's uh, Mammy and Zip Kuhn and, um, oh my gosh, um, I'm sorry, um, I'm blanking on the, the girl's name uh, right now. But so they're essentially traveling minstrels, right? And so they come in uh, to the space and they're already in blackface. So you're watching black actors in blackface. The experience of walking actors through that blackface experience versus the race face experience in an octoroon are two totally different mm -hmm. things because the contexts are so different. Um, it is, one, it's, it's challenging um, because you're asking, you're asking someone to do something that is so uncomfortable on so many levels and you can't escape um, and you can't deny the actor's personal vulnerabilities mm -hmm. around that. It has to be addressed. Um, and then two, it adds this whole, in another incredible layer to the play in and of itself. Um, so it, it's mm -hmm. a process mm -hmm. um, and it's not anything that anyone goes into easily. And 
no one has the luxury to not think about the history that they're bringing in with them when they do it. Mm -hmm. So what's the extent of the, of the director's responsibility in, a, in the rehearsal setting to allow for the cultural realities of all of the folks who might be in a cast mm -hmm. um, to be fully respected, to acknowledge, to bring the, the, you know, the context with them, their lived experience with them into the creative process. To make space to talk about it, mm -hmm. to not ignore it, to sit mm -hmm. in the room and say, all right, we're all used to seeing all of these faces and now we're gonna do something, we're gonna alter those faces and we need to talk about what that feels like, how you're gonna take that in, what that, how that might shift your experience and create space for people to have whatever reaction they need to have mm -hmm. um, in order for them to move through it. Because you have to, uh, in my mind, walk with so much sensitivity um, because it's not just about what that show needs, what that part requires, but it's also, again, what that actor is bringing to that particular moment. Um, and for some, it's, it's theater, it's stage makeup, and we're playing. Uh, and in Neighbors, it was quite a different experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you think about this kind of general topic this evening, how would you say the landscape is changing around what stories are told and who gets to tell them? Are there rules? Should there be rules? <laughs> You just know when it's bad. Right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was, I, 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 I've been in an interesting experience um, as of late around this question of uh, who gets to tell, you know, whose stories, and um, and it's 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 really, it's so complicated, um, and uh, and you know, uh, I, I keep thinking about the stories I want to that that I want to be told, and so for example. You know, I've had an artistic director be in touch with me several times about um, uh, doing a play that has six transgender characters, um, and he's having trouble uh, casting uh, all, all the parts with transgender actors, and it's written by a non-transgender writer, and can, can he do the play? And hearing mm -hmm. about the lack of, um, uh, the lack of uh, authenticity by because it's a playwright who's not transgender and then if one character isn't and what does that mean if one actor isn't and and like so what are the what are the rules so to speak and in a way I feel like I mean I think there are some cases that are are more clear-cut and then I think there are other moments that it feels less clear and the rules feel le less clear to me and you know he's calling me and saying uh, can I still produce the play? And I'm getting a lot of flack about even taking it on because it's by you know a non-transgender writer. And and you know, again, I don't know if this makes me like a moderate Democrat or something. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, my response to him was, you have to do the play because even if it's not you know perfect. I mean, you ha one is you have to go to all of the effort. Of, of finding the right people for those parts. So you have to do all of your work, right? And then, um, and then I think we, we need the stories, right? So for a person to, for a young transgender person to come into that audience and see anybody that remotely looks like them on stage will be life-changing, you know? And it's our job in the theater to create those moments for people to see themselves um, as, as embodied, you know, and uh, as real. I mean, that's what the imagination, that's the, um, that's the great magic of the theater, right? So for me, you know, I was like, wow, I say go for it. I mean, you know, because you're doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing and you're, you're doing your, your work here, um, and, um, and, I, and, and it will be, the work will be imperfect. And so I think the tough part is, you know, we live in a, um, you know, in a, it, particularly in a social media culture that um, doesn't allow for many mistakes, um, doesn't allow for much imperfection, uh, and I think we're fumbling imperfectly mm -hmm. and feeling, um, at least I know for myself, feeling very fearfully about what it means to fumble imperfectly about how mm -hmm. we do this work. Yeah. And, um, and so what I'm, I guess what I'm hoping, you know, as we think about this is how we come to it with incredible rigor and simultaneously incredible generosity, you know, to mm -hmm. one another. Um, so I think it's both those things. I don't think it's letting each other off the hook for not doing our work, 
Um, and I also think it's having some kind of generosity to know we're going to do that work imperfectly as we try to sort these issues out at a really complicated time. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to talk about it. Yep. And to talk about it as frankly and transparently yep. as you possibly can, right? So mm -hmm. not only should that, you know, do the work and then do the work, but then also have the conversation that expresses like, well, this is how we came to that decision and this is what it looks like and this is what it means and how did it affect you? Like mm -hmm. to have those conversations in a meaningful way feels really important to mm -hmm. kind of walk alongside that choice to you know try to go the distance, not be able to go all the way there, but at least talk about the decision process, decision making mm -hmm. process. Uh, I, I hate this question. I actually really, it upsets me so much mm -hmm. about authenticity. Like mm -hmm. I just, it makes me insane because nothing, nothing that I've ever written is authentic. I mean, I make up stuff and, and no, <laughs> nobody, you know, I mean, well, I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. It makes me, it makes me feel like, like um, uh, I will be silenced for, for doing what I do by some, you know, I don't know, the social media, whatever thing, uh, I, it, I can't even talk. I'm so upset. Um, and I think, at least for the mm -hmm. create, you know, at least for the people who write plays and the people who who um, inhabit those bodies on stage, right? Who who come to the theater and put on costumes and um, engage with an audience, um, which is different than what the how producers program a season. But uh, there is no authenticity. I mean, e even your autobiography is a story that you mm -hmm. make up um, in order to achieve an end. And that depends on your aesthetic as an artist, and it depends on what audience you're trying to reach, and it depends, you know, I'm going to tell my story differently to a, a different room. Um, and, and I think um, I chafe against anyone telling me what I'm allowed, what story I'm allowed to tell I, 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 violently. Um, um, yeah, that's all. So if we burst this bubble of the fact that, you know, we're not, it can't be authentic because I, it is story. It is, you know, representation of a representation and you can add the multiple layers. How do you then um, address the complexity of issues because they kind of coexist? So, so what are your thoughts about how you engage folks around these issues in a way that doesn't do what you feel, that, well, what you're reacting to. I, I think you right. You uh, you have a lot of different people writing stories, mm -hmm. and you produce them, like you mm -hmm. know, at your theater, right, or here, and you you bring a community of of different kinds of storytellers, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Company One. I mean, that's a diff. So you talk about that, right? That's diff <laughs> it's different, <laughs> right? It's different than, right? Yes, it is different. Um, uh, in terms of, I mean, I too chafe against authenticity. It's also the word used by the Gilbert Sullivan Society to justify their production uh, of, of um, uh, um, Mikado. the Mikado right. because it was written to be authentically Japanese, played authentically by white people. Um, <laughs> So we had to engage that, mm -hmm. and we had to engage them and explain to them the history of how Gilbert and Sullivan came upon the Japanese influence in that, they, that there was a Japanese exhibition in London and they saw a nice Japanese print and they decided they wanted to do something about Japan. It was, it was props and costumes that inspired Gilbert and Sal uh, Sullivan to write about Japan. They had never even been to Japan. so. That kind of appropriation, I, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something we chafe against and certainly being held to authenticity, even in our own work. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that there's anything, I mean, th I don't know who defines it, first right, of all. Right. Whose version of auth authentic mm -hmm. are we talking about? So in, 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 you know, the experiences of our writers, as varied as they are, you know, the, 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 when we do work and it, it, it happens in a space and interacts with an audience, that atmosphere is authentic for me. Mm -hmm. um, that engagement with the audience, mm -hmm. that's the authentic experience. Um, and how, how the, the, the text translates across the footlights, so to speak. That's what you're after, yeah. I think, real engagement. 
um, and, and, and I go by one rule, know for whom you make and uh, know why you make and for whom you make. Uh, I think that's the golden rule that I've followed in mm -hmm. running the theater company. Mm -hmm. Great, wow. Now that was a good segue, you know, the footlights, the magic that happens across the, the footlights. So um, we've been talking kind of within the theater, but it is in the magic that uh, happens uh, across the footlights uh, where the interaction really occurs. So does it matter to audiences? Uh, do these internal conversations matter? Do you care? Um, is it of interest to you who does what and who gets to do what? Do you feel invested, concerned, distressed about these controversies? So now it's the panel, I mean, it's the audiences opportunity to chat with our panelists. You will note that there are two mics, one stage left, one stage right here. Uh, and we ask that you come on down and pose your questions at the mic so everyone can hear you and so folks on HowlRound can hear you as well. So questions for the panel. You must be brave. I have a question yeah. for Ralph. Yeah. Uh, it, so, <laughs> well, it's it's actually for it's for all three, which is I'm struck by the um, injustice of um, of a playwright needing to come in and confront a producer about uh, about production choices. It's that power, you know, that we talked about the power imbalance, and and that feels so wrong. Um, um, that, you know, the playwright needs to be so vigilant. And I, I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you guys had any thoughts on that. Um, great question. Well, um, you know, I have this, uh, the Wong Kids was done in Iowa, um, and uh, Lloyd gave the rights, and they actually rented our entire set and costumes. And then we assumed that they understood what Wong kids <laughs> meant <laughs> until we saw the production photos and yeah. they were all white. Uh, it was an all white production. That happened a year, bef a year before the Jesus in India incident. So Lloyd has experience right. with mm. not being vigilant. Right. And mm. so, um, in fact, he wasn't that vigilant with Jesus in India. He didn't find out until they posted uh, cast photos. He didn't know. Um, and at that point, Lloyd was also uh, Lloyd had a play in New York running off Broadway about Charlie Chan in which he has a white guy playing yellow face. Right. So he was in the middle of this kind of racial sensitivity in his head when Jesus in India happened. Right. And that's why he felt he could not let that go because it would feel hypocritical right. after showing this new play in New York, then saying, well, then, you, you know, this is fudgeable. Right. And so he, he went and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, exercised his rights. And the playwright never gives up his or her rights to her work. Even if a producer licenses it, the playwright owns that material forever and ever and can do whatever he or she pleases right. with that play. Right. So that's the power of the writer. Thank goodness for that. I, I just want to say there's something to me about the conversation around the authenticity, uh, and I, I completely hear and understand your point of view. I think there's a bit of a slippery slope in that people um, can say, well, uh, I, I tried to be authentic, but that didn't work out, so I did this instead, right? And what that's actually doing is dishonoring the work of the playwright. Right. Um, and I, I think we need to make sure and uphold that um, if, a, if a playwright is choosing to be specific as to who is in that story and how that story is happening to that person and whether or not the 
who that person is has a deep influence on what the story is or not. If you say that you have X person, right, that it's the producer's job to figure out how to honor that mm -hmm. to the best of their ability no matter what. Yeah. Also, I just want to say diversity shouldn't be easy. It isn't easy. You have to work at it. Mm -hmm. And so when people look, you know, with out around the street for the actors that they need and can't find them there and give up, well, that's not enough. It's not supposed to be easy. You're supposed to go out of it. It's supposed to be difficult and you have to go out and you have to put out resources if you're committed to diversity. And it has to be risky. Yeah. Like it's not gonna come in a nice clean package. package yeah. I have, you know, it's there's something about discovering new talent from new places, right, that n are not on backstage or not on stage source and have never even come into a theater before. Mm -hmm. There's talent there. It can be found, it can be grown, it can be cultivated. You have to do the work to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So from someone who's not in the theater um, and doesn't really understand the internal workings, um, educate me about attitudes toward uh, playwrights control that are, you know, maybe we could step away from the third rail of race and gender and that stuff. If a playwright's licensing terms say, I, I want full control over the cast, I'm gonna sit by your shoulder, you know, that guy's gotta be more than 250 pounds. Uh, this one's hair isn't curly enough. Uh, you know, that one's kind of whiny. I mean, is that, is that in the range of reason or is that playwright being way out on the tail of the curve impossible to work with? And, you know, if, if I guess helping to understand uh, what the, what the prevailing attitude is or what you wish the attitude were towards the playwright's control over casting, you know, separate from the stuff that gets everyone's hair on the back of their neck up around race mm -hmm. would help elucidate this a lot for some of us who don't. Uh, I don't know if I have a great answer. Um, when you, in your example, um, I think Sam Hunter is his name. I think he wrote a play called The Whale, mm -hmm. uh, right, about yeah. um, a quote unquote morally obese man, right, who is trapped in his apartment. Now, if for some reason there's some director or, or producing company that casts someone that is 200 pounds in that role, they have missed the mark. Right? They've, they're, they're missing a point in the storytelling. So it, if the playwright, if, if there's not a mechanism inside that company to say like, wait a second, we're doing something wrong here, or the director doesn't have that mechanism, hopefully the playwright is there within reason, right? And not just kind of saying, oh, that person has a green eyelash and I don't want that on my stage, mm -hmm. right? As long as that person isn't being particular in a way that is not in service to the play, I think they have every right to work to kind of help telling the story if the company is finding it challenging to tell that story. And that's what I think, so there's a, an if kind of around that for me. Yeah, and standard dramatist contract and even with the contracts with the agents, specify uh, playwright approval over casting. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. You work with your directors, you work with, to arrive at the right people so that the demands are not unreasonable, but the playwright does have a say in the final choices made. It oftentimes not a contentious um, issue because you're all, you've been working on this play for a while, you're on the same page, uh, so so that, that, yeah. that's there. And it also depends too on the, um, I mean, you know, it depends on what production it is. Like sometimes if it's the 50th production of your play, you're much less attached to yes. how it's being cast and how it's being done. Um, if it's the first production of your play, you're very, very hands-on. Um, and uh, in the case of even, I think, you know, in Lloyd's case, I mean, colleges and, and universities do a lot of plays and often, you know, playwrights are more and less aware of that. So, I mean, so it really kind of depends on what theater is doing it, which production it is, um, to, uh, to the degree that how involved. And I think in Lloyd's case, you know, not unusual that he wouldn't be involved until he realized something was awry. Um, but there are, you know, character descriptions on a script. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is part of the script and part of what, you know, should be, <laughs> should be followed. Yeah, and, but there's also now this move, uh, push for playwrights to be specific if they want the mm -hmm. characters mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. yep. of a certain ethnicity yep. and not to leave it uh, open because yep. the default is 
always uh, mostly not to, to go with uh, uh, a white performer. But, uh, you know, uh, the famous example, Beckett and, and Mamet, especially, you know, he, uh, I know David Mamet will shut down a production if uh, the casting, they cast a woman in a role mm -hmm. instead of a man. Yeah. Right, so he mm -hmm. won't, he, he still won't allow that to happen. Yep, that's um, right. yep. um, and Beckett has been mm -hmm. dead and still, <laughs> you still yeah. can't do Beckett any way you want to do it because yeah. the estate will come after you. So yeah. um, some playwrights have a long reach. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. And, some, and some don't. And some don't. Yes, David. Uh, so I, I want to uh, actually take it just a little uh, different direction, if I could. It seems to me that a lot of what's happening in terms of, you, you mentioned that the theater is just waking up to mm -hmm. these issues, and in some ways the culture is waking up in a different way, or, or we're hearing it differently, we're hearing it more. I was just struck by all the conversation around Cam Newton and around Beyonce at the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. and all, like, wow, what happened there? But it seems that the um, part of what we're talking about on this panel, these, these instances are actually about the fact that the institution of theater hasn't woken up. Mm -hmm. And what's having to happen is the conversation is having to come in such right. uh, extreme mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and maybe ungenerous, but because out of, out of mm -hmm. enormous mm -hmm. frustration over years of no change. Mm -hmm. And so you talk about power, um, you know, Summer, you talk about the, who's making the choices. And the people who are making the choices haven't changed. And we, you know, the, the title of the panel being Interrogating Whiteness, what we're really doing here is politely saying, this is what's happening because mm -hmm. you, as, as the leadership of the theater, haven't changed. And I think, it, could you guys talk a little bit about mm -hmm. what, the, what the, the relationship between these issues and what the, you're experiencing in the culture around this and, and how it has to do with, I mean, we say this, this fragility word, but what's, what is actually causing the kinds of uh, problems that you're experiencing or that the field is experiencing or we're seeing in the culture as it relates to who has the decision uh, and, and what is and isn't awake mm -hmm. in that? I think it has to do with retention of power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Just wanting to hold on to power, voice, um, I'm the person who can make the decision, you are not, right? Like, it, it, it's so steeped in um, the nastiness of elitism uh, that it, it's, that's, that needs to crack open in order for anything to actually feel like it has a lasting, long range, wide range effect, in my opinion. I think too that the the assumption of privilege is being challenged in a way mm -hmm. uh, consistently, and it probably has to do with the uh, the awareness of the national conversation um, that people do feel empowered to say, "Hey, you can't do that anymore." Um, whether it's art, individual artists, or, or or audiences saying, "You know, you know, you can't do a season without any female playwrights anymore." Um, right. So. Uh, um, the, the, the privilege of choosing a season, the privilege of producing this show the way you want to, the privilege of casting who you feel like you want to cast, I think that's being interrogated um, on a much uh, broader scale. Uh, yeah, uh, but I, 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 yes, the people that make the choices, make those choices, I, I don't think that they've acknowledged their own biases um, and, and so keep making the same choices, but they continue to make those choices because there's a market for those choices. Mm -hmm. So and it needs to be not a top-down revolution, but sort of our global. The audience also has, has a role in, in, to play mm -hmm. in, in changing the dynamics in theater. Um, you have to demand of your institutions that they reflect mm -hmm. the community you live in. Um, and you gotta put, that's, that's, that will change theater faster than you can say theater. 
But I think the ugliness of it is that there are some people who, who don't want to see that change. That's absolutely right. right. What that change indicates is the way that you're comfortable sitting in the theater. Yeah. That's right. Because mm -hmm. there's someone who's not going to know your theater rules, right? Yeah. And it's going to make you want to turn around and shush someone. Yeah. You have no right to shush that person, yeah. right? Yeah. But So it's going to shift the way you consume your art. Yeah. And all of a sudden, your thing is under attack mm -hmm. in a way that you may not be ready to kind of release. Sure. <laughs> to younger people, people who are look different than you, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that also has to be examined because you're exactly right. The audience is a part of the machine that's kind of keeping things status quo mm -hmm. and their stake in the game is, well, this is my thing and this is how I know my thing. That's right. And mm -hmm. this is how I want my thing. Yeah, but it's does it, but mm -hmm. also is, it, isn't the, co the country itself isn't ready to, I don't, that's, this has been, one of the biggest, you know, uh, undercurrent of American society for I don't know how long, and and nobody's really talking about race and ethnicity honestly, um, at least not in the not in the flyby states, mm -hmm. and so th that will until th that happens they don't want the change and it'll always be this kind of bi coastal. Well, we were uh, also very comfortable, you know, we as a nation. Um, believing that we were in a post-racial post -racial yeah. era. Say, yeah. You know, so, wow, people really have to keep talking about race? Yeah. You know, can't we just bask in the glow of it's, mm -hmm. oh, it's fine, we've made progress. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, Barack is president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that did it magically. <laughs> Polly, were you going to say something? Oh, I just was going to. I mean, I just quickly, I was going to say, um, you know, we, we're a, an art form that has prided ourselves on our exclusivity, um, and uh, um, I think that's been at the heart of um, how we've formed ourselves as a as a as an art form, as institutions. Um, we have a whole um, history of. Um, you know, um, the higher ticket price, the better seat, um, the um, more you donate, the better you're treated. Um, I mean, it's a, and I, I think Ralph keeps saying, I mean, it's a, it's a human rights issue and you know, who do the arts belong to? And I think we have a history in this country of the arts, you know, not belonging to everyone, um, but belonging to a kind of, ex you know, a kind of exclusive club. And I think, um, uh, and I think, you know, the people that get to, uh, are privileged to enjoy that exclusivity uh, don't like giving it up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and that's no, you know, we, that, that's, uh, um, uh, we, we have a history of that in this country, and so I think the theater is a reflection of that, and that's really, that's what has to change, is that, that sense of the art form as exclusive. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that each of the panelists might talk a little bit about what your vision, what your dream, what your goal is, um, what is it that we're striving for in this um, effort that we're talking about? Is it a colorblind society mm -hmm. in which um, black performers can perform in a white role, uh, women can perform in a male role? Um, is that the vision? Is it a different vision from that? And I'm asking the question in the context of um, race pride mm -hmm. and those sort of sentiments that I have when sometimes I go to the theater and I see some things and it even it either evokes uh, race pride or makes me very angry. Um, I had the good fortune of seeing Anna Oxaroon and there's a wonderful, wonderful scene where the lead actor puts on uh, uh, white face, the black actor that puts on white face. And I've been thinking about that play for the, whatever, a week and a half since I have seen it. Um, and I said to myself, A, how would I have felt if that were a white person putting on blackface? Or how would, how does a white person feel about seeing a black person put on whiteface? So I, I really would like the panelists to just sort of talk about what are we striving for? What are we moving toward here? Who would like to jump into that one? <laughs> um, I will, and then everyone will forget what I said, and it's great. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, okay. Um, I'm gonna tell the truth about myself a little bit, and I think tell the truth about uh, my company, Company One Theater, a little bit. Um, 
for me, I don't think, I, I have never actually, except for one moment, which definitely coincides with our President Barack Obama, uh, his, uh, you know, the first election uh, when all the votes were in, uh, and I was like, you know, watching at a, at a like party. It felt like a huge event. And, um, and then the poll numbers came in and Barack Obama's president. And I got a text from my dad saying, welcome home. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that just like, it, it landed with me because I often don't, I often don't feel American, if that makes any sense. Uh, and and I, I would love to feel a sense of feeling American and also being able to feel proud of what that means and feeling that it's inclusive um, and feeling that it's not at um, me needing to kind of, to label myself um, African American because you're, you're there but you're not quite there, right? Um, and that's not negating my blackness, right? That's just being able to say that I, I was born here, I am of here. Um, for me, in terms of the theater and for, for Company One Theater, I'd love to see us embark on this kind of the new frontier of American theater, meaning that there is an opportunity for us to see, produce, engage with, write, develop, consume as audience members new work that has, there's a, a multiplicity of voices, there's a range of whose stories gets told, but those stories and the range of those stories aren't predicated on the skin color of the person who's telling them, but they can still be American stories so that I can, I can find myself represented on stage and not necessarily know that this play is going to be some sort of historical piece about my blackness mm -hmm. or some sort of future prediction about my blackness or something about the plight of my blackness. Um, but it, it can, I can just be a person in a living room d drama that does not negate my blackness but is also not centered on it. Mm -hmm. um, and not because I don't want my blackness to be included but I want it to be included in a way that whiteness is included um, and therefore not at the center of everything, right? And that's a risky thing for me to say personally because I'm about to use a phrase that I don't know if I believe in, but black theater, quote unquote, is totally my jam. It's what I do, it's what I love. I love telling those stories, right? So it's not about erasure, but it's about understanding that there is there's an opportunity for us to press this thing forward in a way that is generating work that is powerful and strong and uh, evocative and representative of all without needing to necessarily be so plot driven about what it is on my skin at that current time of the storytelling. Um, that's just something that interests me because I find that we don't have it. Um, Company One Theater produced uh, a. Ray Pamatmat's um, Edith Can Shoot Things and Hit Them. And there was a whole lot of crap that happened because the, the, um, the story centers on uh, two uh, Philip a brother and sister, two Filipino uh, kids, and someone reviewed it and said, well, but it, that didn't have anything to do about you know, being Filipino. It didn't talk about what it meant for them to like right. go to school and be Filipino. Well, that wasn't the point. <laughs> that, was, that was not the point. That was not the story that I was telling. And, and how, how could you negate that for your own, well, I was seeking this information out of this play and you delivered that and, and therefore I find that problematic. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really tough place for us to still be, mm -hmm. I think. Sorry. Uh, I, I'd like to see 50% um, of the theaters in this country run by women, 50% of the managing directors women, 
I'd like to see more actors of color coming out of graduate programs in directing, acting, um, theater management. Um, it's a real problem, um, the lack of opportunities for training young uh, people to go into the theater. And people aren't going to go into the theater unless they can make a living at it. And I think we have to be offering our women, our actors of color, um, our, our young talent, ways that they can survive. You know, television is so far ahead of the curve right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what you see on television, you don't see in the theater. Mm -hmm. And I think that's disgraceful. <laughs> um, and, you know, is it 2046? Latinos 50% of the population? Sure, yeah, half. Let's, let's go for half. Um, uh, and, and more specifically, um, where is that handsome man who asked the question? Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to be able to go to the theater and see a, a, an absolutely colorblind uh, streetcar named Desire and not think about it. Um, so I think uh, I would like to see access for actors of color in every role and women and that's what I think. Uh, I would like to see, I would like to see, I would like to see equity. That's what we're asking for. Um, stakes, uh, equal partnership in what happens uh, to our, to our, to, uh, to the future of this rubric that we might call American theater. I don't even know mm. if that exists. Uh, but we need to be stakeholders in in whatever that is, and currently we are not. We are on the margins with other people deciding where to steer this ship, and us going, hey, 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 we're drowning. Um, uh, and that's been, that's been the case for decades. Uh, of, of sometimes I think we even self-marginalize. We self-marginalize because it's the only way we're gonna get noticed. We have to say, I am an Asian American theater company, therefore I should be part of the conversation because otherwise you won't have Asian American theater as part of the conversation. I have to self-identify as an othered mm -hmm. uh, company. So I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be part, I want to be at the table when those things are being decided. That's equity. Holly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know what to say. I mean, you all said it lovely and I, <laughs> I don't think about, it's odd, I guess I don't think, I don't think about that question as like what I want for the theater, I think about what I want for the world, and I think about what I want for the country, and so I just think I want to live in a more just culture, you know, and uh, more equitable, and I feel like the theater, um, you know, telling stories in a way that represents uh, who we are as a nation is, is a contribution that the theater can make, you know, and so I guess I don't want any percentage, this is, I shouldn't say this because it's being live streamed, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. <laughs> I don't want um, any percentage of the country to believe, you know, like one word out of Donald Trump's mouth. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like I'm actually trying to like create that world um, and uh, that's what I'm kind of interested in. And so I, I think um, having these kind of conversations um, and, um, uh, and really um, uh, creating a, 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 a theater that looks like the country that is respectful of the journey and the struggle of what it has been to be of other genders and other races and um, uh, other ethnicities um, is this, you know, is the story of America. And I, I want to make theater that's that story, you know. So I guess that's, um, so that's kind of what I feel like uh, the vision is in terms of the work. We're going to move into um, rapid fire response yeah. to questions <laughs> because short. I see we have some much. folks backing up here. So if you'll uh, ask your question. Hi, thank you very much for your time. My name is Mara. Um, <laughs> Melinda's previous student, by the way. Um, <laughs> and on the one hand, I champion new works um, because I think that's such an exciting thing to be part of and I've been blessed to have been part of um, several new works here in Boston uh, to give embodiment uh, to some of those characters. Um, but I also have a fondness for classical works, works that have a history behind them, Shakespeare. I'm a big Shakespeare geek and I love it. Um, but I don't see a lot of other actors or directors who look like me. Um, and I'm just wondering in, in your work, how have you engaged with race or gender or class issues and classical works? 
uh, is that Mar is that directed at one of us in particular? Yeah. Do you do you do new classes? works only? New works only. <laughs> <laughs> I don't deal in the classic. Um, uh, you have. I mean, you know, <laughs> what does one say? I mean, I, I think you know. I, I mean, there's nothing better than um, taking the classical works and turning them upside down. I feel like. Um, uh, um, you know, there are directors like Yale Farber out of South Africa who's doing that. Um, we've had, um, uh, we did her Miss Julie, uh, you know, reimagining entirely um, Strindberg's Miss Julie. And then, um, you know, uh, the, uh, I don't know if you saw, if any of you came to the uh, Sangwa Ensemble, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, a South African company um, doing Carmen, doing Midsummer Night's Dream. And it's completely different in the rhythms of um, uh, the culture and the reality. And so for me, that's as important of work as, I mean, a lot of us here uh, have a lot of experience in the world of new works, but that work is, is as important. Um, and I think that's why Hamilton is the show, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it totally reimagines. It's not, a, it's a yeah. new work, I realize, but it's taking an old story um, and making it entirely fresh. And, uh, um, and so I think taking old stories and figuring out how they are um, reflective of this this uh, this time is, um, you know, I, I feel like we've done a lot of that work at um, Arts Emerson, and um, that is um, as much a part of, um, you know, as much a part of the work as doing the new the new plays. You know, OSF uh, yeah. Oregon Shakespeare yeah. Festival mm -hmm. is doing the translation project, mm -hmm. and they have commissioned contemporary writers and assigned them each of the plays to translate with very specific parameters. And a lot of those writers commissioned are writers of color. Also, Desdemona Chang is at this in this season's uh, slate for OSF to direct uh, Wintersdale. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Ed Iskandar, who's also a director in New York, has been, de has been dealing with classics mm -hmm. as a director of mm -hmm. color, but not enough. Yeah, I, I, I personally think it's a huge waste of time to do classics as <laughs> they were done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any, I mean, I'm, I love the reimagining, whether it, I mean, even the Colored Museum, right? The Huntington mm -hmm. did the Colored Museum uh, last season and season before, which, you know, it's a contemporary classic reimagined. Uh, 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 so there's lots of contemporary, there are contemporary classics and there are the Shakespeare. Um, and I think it's often about bringing in a director of color. That That's what gets the thing ignited. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question about what Summer said about the audience being part of the mechanism. Um, I attended the press performance of an Octoroon. It was hilarious, great show, very funny, very thought-provoking. And imagine my surprise when after the intermission I noticed about a third of the audience had walked out. And I thought this was very important and interesting, not just like <gasps> shocking, but interesting. And I read reviews of the show and nobody talked about it. And you folks have talked about you know, bringing playwrights to task about doing the work but being generous, producers of, of, of shows doing the work and being generous. How can you encourage audiences to do the work and be as generous? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, uh, I think we encourage it in a, a lot of ways. There's only can bring a horse to water, right? So um, uh, we work uh, really hard at Company One to wrap a lot of dramaturgical material around everything that we do, right? And so we have a really fantastic uh, double team of dramaturgs, Ramona and Haley, who are there. Uh, and uh, they create a lot of contextual support for the play, right? So people have an opportunity to read things about the play, to watch a video about the play, to uh, come into the lobby, read more material, talk to someone. There's someone who stands out there and says, look, you know, I, if you want to talk about the play, here I am, talk about the play. Um, so a lot of that work happens, right? If you are coming into the space, and you're not quite sure what you're going to see. And so the, and I'm gonna blow a little bit of it for some people, but you come in, 
<laughs> uh, it's not major, it's not major, it's not major. Yeah. But you know, you come in and you have a seat and someone does the curtain speech and they leave the room and then nothing happens. That's disarming, right? Automatically, people are like, well, something's wrong, right? Because you said thanks and enjoy. <laughs> and I'm not enjoying, right? <laughs> like, automatically, something is off, right? And that's on purpose. Uh, and then you're met with a barrage of F-bombs, like pew, 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 right? And if you're of a certain constitution and that doesn't fly, you're already shutting down to what the experience could be, right? And then, I won't say what it is, but there's, a moment where there is sound that is loud and brash and hits you with the n-word about you know i don't know in four four time essentially right um consistently about 35 times in two minutes uh if you if you aren't willing to stay and fight and engage and want to have the experience you're not going to have it. Um, and quite frankly, that's, uh, that is an agonizing thing, right? Because uh, I am proud to say that I am a part of making all of those decisions, right? And I stand by all of them. But it's really difficult when the people who need the work the most aren't willing to wrestle with it. And that's a part of the challenge of changing that status quo, the challenge of changing uh, the audience and how the audience consumes their art, um, and a part of kind of shifting the dynamics. So for those people who were like, I can't and I won't, so I'm leaving, probably, as they're leaving, they're complaining about what they're leaving and maybe why that even got made, but I promise you, or I'd like to believe that they're still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so even if they aren't able to stay in the fight all of the rounds, that little bit of fight that they were in will have an impact, hopefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what matters the most. But that, it sucks, <laughs> it sucks. But you also, that sort of thing takes time. It takes time to shift, um, to shift that constitution. Sorry, that was a super long answer. No, it was a, it was a great. Um, yes, we, we're, I'm gonna try to get through those yeah, last. Hi, hi everybody, questions. I really appreciated hearing each of your visions around what you'd like to see the theater become in terms of being able to tell a lot of different stories using people from different race, class, uh, and gender backgrounds. I think one of the things that I have a really hard time trying to figure out is how do you escape the legacy, the structural legacy of how people's uh, humanity is defined, whether they're women or mm -hmm. black, uh, in terms that are very defined by the white dominant culture. So you have a white voice or you have the white, as it comes to race, the white voice or the white gaze that defines who you are. And so those stories really are, are repeating even though they're using uh, black actors or they're using it, you're being defined in a way that is structurally based versus mm -hmm. based on somebody's humanity. Somebody's humanity has really been redefined based on uh, the white dominant culture and that legacy is still with us. So I just want to know how do you want to es how do you escape that, in terms of really telling stories that are really true to true to humanity across a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. spectrums. So uh, we have a our our response to that is to put together a writers lab, whose mandate is to return that gaze, mm -hmm. and to speak from their own truths, mm -hmm. and they're all writers of color, mm -hmm. and so their that lens that they th that they see the world in, is is different and their voices are empowered. Uh, they have age, their characters, their co the characters that they write, characters of color have agency in the story and they're not these caricatures and, 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 and uh, um, two dimensional tropes 
<laughs> that have existed in the past. I think that's our solution to it is to bring writers, the generative writers into the mix mm -hmm. to try to overcome that legacy. Mm -hmm. Last two questions here. We have two more people, and then I see Kevin's getting ready to give me the hook. Sure, too. Uh, so speaking on the point of uh, that change can't come without change in the leadership, um, that made me think in the same vein, uh, this topic in the educational setting, so how, what's going to be different? What are we te teaching our young people? So um, what is the right, my right to tell someone else's story? What um, I, I think about how transformative the learning in a situation where I'm working on a show can be um, in the sense that I can learn about someone else and other people. So how do we, how do we handle that? What, how, what do we teach our young people to um, listen empathetically and understand and speak to someone else's story without um, impressing our own bias into that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, we all know the arts is slashed in schools. There's no time to, you know, kids don't have art class. They don't have mm -hmm. music. They don't study. You know what I mean? I don't. I, I mean, that's a. I, I made a joke coming in here that I, I, I felt like I felt like I was coming in as Hillary Clinton into a Bernie Sanders rally because of my. <laughs> You know, but I feel like Bernie Sanders, where I say, you know, really, really, the, and I think in the public schools, it really, really needs a revolution that's very focused on it, arts curriculum, and that's so lame, such a lame answer to such a perceptive question. I don't know. I, I, I think it's a life process. Yeah. I think it's something you you will you you should be struggling with and asking throughout your life, because the world changes, your perception changes, you grow, your life experience. Uh, change so that's a question you should ping yourself by forever yeah we we talk in a, a class um, the creative producing class that we do here uh, you know uh, there's a wonderful um, thinker named Charles Baxter who talks about um, imaginative empathy yeah. um, and the um, ability you know to have imaginative empathy I think is the purpose of I mean, to me, that's the purpose of learning and teaching, is to teach that, uh, in, especially in the theater, um, and to, um, uh, the only way we will, um, you know, uh, we will solve some of the problems that we've talked about tonight is if we can, you know, truly um, begin to see ourselves in, you know, in the, in, the, in, in the spaces where other people live, right? And so that imaginative empathy is, I think, um, to me, um, it's the, it's, it, that's what education should be should be about, and I hope that's, um, um, you know, uh, how we keep thinking about what stories we tell and how we tell them through that lens. Mm -hmm. Exposure, you might wrestle with how, but the exposure is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last question of the evening. Hi, so um, I'm not exactly sure how to articulate this question, but as an audience member, I sometimes feel uncomfortable with, um, especially actresses of color, uh, I guess, I, I don't really know how to explain it. I feel like it's a very, maybe this is more in film, but uh, a lighter complexion dominates both theater and film, and it makes me uncomfortable because I feel like it alters um, a mainstream like perception of what beauty is, um, and I feel like it has a really strong effect on the black community as well and um, affects the way that we think about colorism in ways that we're not even like aware of. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is we talked about earlier how we are looking towards um, a more colorblind uh, world of theater, but how, how do you represent um, a variety of color and race and gender, but still like make sure that all of those areas are still represented without showing, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's clear. clear. It's clear. <laughs> no, it's great. It's a really great question. It's a really great question because what you're talking about is a spectrum, right? And honoring the spectrum of people. Um, and and um, 
it, oh God, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Number one, and I think, um, I think you have to have a certain level of awareness, right? You have a certain level of awareness, and therefore that awareness will make you proactive about it, right? I have a certain level of awareness, and that awareness makes me proactive about that. Um, and so, thinking about um, what we've been taught as the ideal, right? And then figuring out how to uplift, illuminate new ideals so that it's not singular is important. Um, and, and hopefully, I, I don't know what you intend to do, but hopefully in your work, right, you'll be able to kind of figure out what it means for you to kind of break down those barriers as to that singular ideal. But the fact that you're aware and thinking about it means something to mm -hmm. someone, mm -hmm. and that's important. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, audience, for your willingness to engage. We promised it wouldn't be tidy. So <laughs> my hope is that you leave here and continue to talk and to think and to question. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.